The question is, we were talking earlier about scientific literacy and our approach towards science uh, as a nation. In your opinion, and you, you serve on science advisory panels, yeah. where do you think we need to go as a nation? What do we need to do to increase our scientific literacy? Uh, to, I'll, go, I'll answer two prompt. One is, what do you do with your kids? And kids need to be able to explore freely. And if you look at most households, they're not designed for that. They're designed to have the kid not explore. The kid comes into your kitchen and pulls out the pots and pans and starts banging them. What's the first thing you do as a parent? Stop that, you're getting the dishes dirty. Yet these are experiments in acoustics. That's what that is. Okay? Whatever the kid is doing, if it has the chance of breaking something, you're going to tell them to not do it without thinking that that's the consequence of an experiment that they are conducting. And every time the kid wants to do something, provided it doesn't kill them, it's an experiment. Let it run its course, even if it makes something messy. You agree to have a kid in the first place? Fine, clean up after them. And when, when they open up... <laughs> because it's those seeds of curiosity that is the foundation of what it is to become a scientist. Now, I don't want everybody to be a scientist. That'd be a boring world. I want the poets, and I want the musicians, and the po I, 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 we need that. And I don't have a, but I'm talking about promoting science literacy. And so the first step for the parent is to get out of the way. Allow the child to explore. They, they start playing in the mud. Don't do that in the mud. I just cleaned those pants. You're getting in the way of another experiment. They start plucking the petals off the flowers you just bought from the, from the florist. And you say, stop that, I just paid $10 for the flowers. Had you let that continue, they'd find in the middle the stamen and the pistol, and they'd learn something about the flower. For 10 bucks. That's cheap. <laughs> Derek Bach, one time president of Harvard, once said, if you think education is expensive, try the cost of ignorance. <laughs> and so... That's, so that's got to start at home, in the schools. I don't have a problem with the fact memorizing, but don't equate that with what it is to be wise or what it is to be smart. Smart should be some combination of that, yes, but also what is your lens on the world? How do you figure things out? And you promote that by stimulating curiosity. And I don't see enough stimulating curiosity in this world. This is a famous school right here. I saw the banner in the opening corridors. So you probably don't have that problem here, all right? But the whole world is not educated in this building. So a lot of change would need to happen in that regard. Now getting back to policy, I have tried. You do a simple Google, like YouTube and Tyson, my name, but put Neil so you don't get Mike. You know, <laughs> dining on someone's ear. You, you, Half, my, half of what, I, what ends up thrown onto YouTube are talks I've given where I'm trying to convince people, not only the public, but lawmakers and people in power, that investing in the frontier of science, however remote it may seem in its relevance to what you're doing today, is a way of stockpiling the seed corns of future harvests of this nation. And those sea corns, what they do is, whether or not you know it today, advancing a frontier, history has shown, has advanced the culture, ever since the Industrial Revolution got underway. And we can speak more hegemonistically about it, that anyone who has embraced the powers of technology has enjoyed economic wealth, the, like, the likes of which the world has never seen, attendant with strength, strength of security, okay? And so people say today, they'll say, so suppose the next attack, terrorist attack, is like a chemical attack. Do you call out the Marines or do you get your best chemists to figure out what to do about that? There's a point where your weapons are not as useful as the brain of the scientist who you could bring to bear on the problem. And so I see science and technology and creative investments in it as the most significant in infusion to our economy that could possibly be conceived. The problem is it's not gonna boost the economy next quarter. 
It's got a time horizon longer than most people have the patience for, and most politicians have the re-election cycle to be tolerant of. So what we need is a longer view on those investments. I don't want to have to have NASA going hat in hand trying to get money to stimulate the frontier of cosmic discovery. And that frontier now involves biologists in the search for life, chemists in understanding the soils of Mars, uh, aerospace engineers. You know what I don't want to do? I don't want to stand in front of eighth graders and say, who wants to be an aerospace engineer so that you can design an airplane that's 15% more fuel efficient than the one your father flew? That's not going to get him. But if I say, who wants to be an engineer and design the airfoil that will fly in the rarefied atmosphere of Mars, I'm going to get the best students in the class, and you know it because that's an exciting project for smart people to work on, motivated people to work on. And when you have them, they invent stuff. They discover things. They transform the culture in which we live. On a time horizon that is not easy to just tell someone in a one sentence soundbite. And what I want is a, a level of science and cultural literacy that will allow the public to be able to think beyond the election cycle. To think for themselves and say, this is a good investment. How many times have you heard people say, if you're not among us here, why are we spending money up there when we have the problems down here? Have you ever asked how much money we're spending up there? Ask that question. You know what the answer is? I've asked people, how much money do you think we're spending? Here's your tax dollar. How much do you think? 10%? 15%? Those are the kinds of answers I get. You know how much is getting spent? The rovers, the, the space station, the, 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 the space shuttles, all the launch vehicles, all the NASA centers is six-tenths of one penny on your tax dollar. Six-tenths of one penny pays for it all. And you're telling me, why are we spending money there and down here? If, if, if you need that money to solve these problems, you got some other problems going on. Okay? <laughs> That's a whole other problem with society. So, I, I'm sorry, I'm spitting, I'm getting off. So, my point is, I think the greatest, oh, <laughs> the, the greatest need is to be able to have the foresight necessary to make investments on the frontier of science, even if at the time you make those investments, you cannot figure out how that might make you rich tomorrow. Michael Faraday, in the 1840s, was the first one to pass a wire through a magnetic field. And it made a little meter tick on a, on a it moved a, 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 a meter. He hooked up to it. Now this guy, you do this and this happens. That's kind of cool. If you're nerdy, it's a, it's a, to a nerd, that's a cool thing, right? You do this and this happens. <laughs> and so what was happening is it induced a current through the wire. He showed his colleagues. It looked like just kind of a curiosity, a toy. Showed it to Parliament. They say, why, is this what we're funding? We're funding this toy? And this may be apocryphal, but it is said of Faraday, in response to this inquiry, said, because they asked, well, what value is this to the British Empire? And to the king, he said, I don't know what value it is today, but I know one day you're going to tax it. <laughs> and in fact, that is the foundation of how all electricity is made today. <laughs> and it would take another 60 years before electricity would come to homes. But who could have known it at the time?